Good afternoon, my friends. This is Jeff Kasman. Welcome to Tradition. This series is a series of conversations, dialogues, occasional debates between myself and my friend uh, Jim De Piante about the issues that people who are new to tradition oftentimes have. Jim, welcome to the show. Hello there, Jeff. I'm glad you could take time off from your retirees' busy summer to uh, jumpstart <laughs> this episode. So folks, today, uh, let's just very quickly review. It's been a few weeks since we uh, were last visiting with you. Uh, this is a series about things that people who are new to tradition, new to the traditional Latin mass, maybe you're just curious about uh, these people you've heard about, traditional Catholics with their Latin and their incense and uh, all of the weird things that they do. Uh, and you're wanting to learn more about the faith, what traditional Catholics believe, what we do, and why. Uh, maybe you've uh, if you're older and your kids have suddenly started talking to you in Latin or they've started going to this uh, this liturgy and you're hearing things about them, you're wondering what's going on. You've heard about this uh, this radical weapon that they use called the rosary, all sorts of other things. And you're just wondering what is going on with these people? This is a good place for you to be. In previous episodes, we've talked about the mass, the various levels of solemnity of mass. If you've gone to your first traditional mass, perhaps it was almost totally silent, and you wondered what's going on. Or maybe you went and it was 90 minutes of glorious singing. We've talked about all of those details, what the differences are in those masses, where they came from, uh, what the church means by all of that. We've talked about the gestures and postures at mass. So if you've seen Catholics doing different things in different places, we've talked about that. And uh, we've talked about things like fasting and absence, why Catholics do it, what it really is, what it's not. Uh, we've talked about the liturgical year and the season of Paschal Tide. Uh, we talk about the, the so-called modern uh, notion of divine mercy and problems with recent uh, canonizations. And we talk about how parents should manage their children in church, what's going on at mass, the level of solemnity and adoration that's proper, and how to handle children, whether they're uh, infants that are crying, they tend not to respond to reason, whether it's toddlers who are doing the things that toddlers do, or older kids, teenagers, maybe who don't want to be there. What's the proper conduct for all of those folks? We've talked about all those things in, in previous episodes. And finally, we've talked about things like uh, what it really means to be a martyr and uh, how you gain that title of martyr and what happens when you're just killed because you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. So if you've ever wondered about those things, if you've ever heard controversy and you had questions, Go back and check the previous episodes, look at the title there, watch it, hopefully it's helpful to you. Today, uh, we're gonna tackle a new uh, and different kind of subject that's partly inspired by recent events and ongoing scandals by certain high-ranking prelates. But as always, this conversation that Jim and I are having uh, is designed to help illuminate the, the truths of the faith that might be hidden sometimes. So today, we're gonna talk about trying to get inside the man, the mind of a man who has center stage uh, in the drama of, of the Catholic faith and of tradition, and oftentimes seems very happy to play the part of a villain. Oh, of course, you're talking about Pope Francis, uh, who seems to have a distinct animus toward all things traditional, including now Granny's Lace. What, what was that about, Jeff? <sighs> you know... <laughs> I, I I try not to, I don't want to be one of those Catholics that feels compelled to, you know, respond publicly and on social media every time the, you know, the Pope says something good or bad. You you would be a busy man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not, not only that, but, uh, you know, it's so frustrating. So yeah, the Pope was, uh, what is it, a month or so ago, he was addressing a group of Sicilian bishops and priests and uh, for context, the, the clergy of, of Sicily uh, are well known for still kind of hanging on to the old style of, of dress and ceremonial vesting and so forth that, frankly, used to be the norm. Throughout <laughs> which, which we would say they do well to, to right. hang on to. <laughs> yeah, they, so they, they're kind of known for that, right? And, and so they all show up. They're eager, of course, to see the Pope, as, as most Catholics would be. And you know, and they're 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 dressed up. They're dressed up well, and they've got this this 
they're known for dressing well during the mass, right? Uh, and the Pope mocked them. In his meeting with them, he was, he was just openly mocking them because he had seen some pictures of priests in Sicily wearing lace albs and <clears throat> cotas. So, uh, it, I mean, even before that, he took a swipe at them for the, for the preaching, which he admitted to know nothing about. I mean, he said, I don't know because I don't go to mass in Sicily. And I don't know how the Sicilian priests preach, whether the, they preach as was suggested in Evangelii Gaudium or whether they preach in such a way that people go out for a cigarette and then come back. I mean, that's just a, that's a, just a gratuitous insult. I mean, what, was, what was the point of that? Um, then he took them to task for, for doing what they do, which is to say for wearing nicely crafted lace albs and cotas. And, and, you know, Catholics have always kind of been the target of, of this kind of criticism, you know, as, as, this, as if it's okay to be a Christian and, and wear nice things six days a week and drive nice cars and have a nice home, but suddenly, God forbid, you go to mass and you wear nice clothes. And of course, a, a priest of all people is going to be closer to, to that, that mystery of, of the incarnation of, of transubstantiation. You know, God forbid that he wear nice things. Um, but anyway, so the, the Pope's words, he says, uh, and, and I always, I think we should always preface this, right? Just, we try to give deference to the Holy Father, especially when the media reports what he says, because let's face it, most of the people in the media, Catholic or otherwise, they're liars, right? They don't, they don't care about the truth. They're looking for clicks. Yeah, they have an agenda. They got their own agenda. Yeah, re readers, clicks, it's, it's money to them. So we, we should always kind of be careful just about taking the press on, you know, on, on face value. But when, when the Holy Father does not come out and, and rebuke them, I mean, there's no accusation that was reported incorrectly when the Vatican doesn't say, no, that was wrong. Well, so we look at his words and he says, yes, yeah, sometimes bringing some of grandma's lace is appropriate. Sometimes it's, it's to pay homage to grandma right? It's to honor grandma, but it's better to celebrate the mother, Holy Mother Church, and how Mother Church wants to be celebrated, so that insularity does not prevent the true liturgical reform that the council sent out. <laughs> what do you say to that? It seems to me that he hates everything that's traditional and seems to believe that anything that's traditional stands in the way of his grand plans to implement, quote unquote, the true liturgical forms that the council sent out, even a lace alb. That seems churlish to me. Jeff, would you perhaps assert that there is one genuinely traditional thing, arguably the most traditional thing in the world today, that he doesn't have this animus toward, that he doesn't hate? Yes, yes, I would. I, and, I would and, say. and that would be the Society of St. Pius X. Jeff, You've, you, I've heard you say that, and I think it's a pretty bold thesis, although I think you do a pretty good job of de defending that, and we will do that in just a moment. But first, let's look at, at Pope Francis's track record with respect to tradition, uh, and just let a few notorious examples suffice. So uh, Pope Francis, the Bishop of Rome, certainly seems to be in opposition to all that is traditional in the Catholic faith. I mean, even I think the most enthusiastic and zealous trads would maybe claim that we represent 2% of, of the church. And I've had some people argue, well, maybe it's 1%. Well, the point is we're, we're a tiny number of people who kind of like the old ways and live the old ways and so forth. It seems like he's obsessed with us. It seems like there are other things that he would want to talk about in the church other than you know, bells and smells and, and, you know, and old things that he thinks are dead. But this, this obsession, whatever the topic is at hand, he always kind of finds a way to get back and make a little swipe at, in this case, grandmas. Right. He was also speaking to a group of teachers recently and, and in a comment that was completely unrelated to the topic at hand and what they were there to see him about, he gratuitously criticized those who, quote unquote, call themselves guardians of tradition, interesting choice of terms there, guardians of tradition, but of dead traditions, saying that failing to move forward is dangerous for the church today. One or two percent 
a, a, an ever-present danger. He continued, there is the fashion in every age, but in this age in the church's life, I consider it dangerous, again, dangerous. And instead of drawing from the roots in order to move forward, meaning fine traditions, we step back, not going up or down, but backward. He continues, this backstepping makes us a sect. It makes you close and cuts off your horizons. Those people call themselves guardians of traditions, but of dead traditions. The true Catholic Christian and human tradition grows, progresses. So there's a lot of talk about growth and progressing. Do you, how do you understand that? <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure I understand his words. I think the only thing I can say with certainty about them is that he believes tradition is inherently bad, dangerous. Uh, I think his actions speak more clearly and certainly louder than his words. Some other examples of those actions, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, first we have early in his pontificate, we have this strange example of the Franciscan friars of the Immaculata. Uh, it was a small- Tr Troublesome church. bunch there, goodness. Yeah, uh, you know, just a, a, a small order, a couple of hundred priests, seminarians, and nuns that were deemed to be overly traditional because they uh, had had determined that they wanted the traditional Latin mass to be the, the center of their spirituality. Um, you know, the, the Vatican then sent a special commissioner to deal with them. I mean, imagine we've got a, a 1.3 billion Catholics, at least on paper. We've got a, a, a global church. Imagine that 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 anybody in the in the Curia would care about a couple hundred priests whose whose focus is traditional Latin mass. I mean, the the lack of proportionality is, is there are there are bigger problems to solve, right? But so anyway, the, the Vatican sends a special commissioner, and the, the Pope forbids the friars from celebrating the the old Latin mass unless they got special permission, and which is not forthcoming. Yeah, and, and not only that, the, the founder of the order was removed, uh, and, and the special commissioner issued a series of stunning sanctions. You know, he closed their seminary. He took all the students and, and sent them to other religious universities in Rome. Uh, he suspended the activities of the friars' lay movement. He suspended the ordinations of new priests and then put a requirement on those priests that were to be ordained in the future that they would have to make kind of an extreme uh, commitment of devotion to the teachings of the Second Vatican, Vatican Council and, and the liturgy that, that came as a result of, of the council, or they would be kicked out. Uh, which, which commitment is not exacted from anybody else? So more recently, we have the case of Father Tate Cameron Schrader, whom Francis appointed to a key position in the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the old Holy Office. Yeah, that didn't last very long, right? And apparently somebody... <laughs> no. Weeks? But by the what time, was his crime, Jeff? His crime, uh, by the time I saw the headline, he was already gone. Uh, his crime was that he had offered the traditional Latin Mass for some pilgrims who had visited Rome. And, and not subsequent to Traditionis Custodius. This had been in the past, before the appointment. He, um, he, <laughs> he, got, he got ratted out by the U.S. Nuncio. By the way, which person the U.S. Nuncio is the successor to Archbishop Carlo Marie, Maria Viganò, who had been the Nuncio. So the, the present Nuncio ratted out uh, uh, Tate, Father Tate Schrader uh, for having celebrated the traditional Latin Mass for pilgrims at St. Peter's long before his appointment. Um, yeah, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> sometimes the Vatican really does move quickly. And, oh, yeah. And, uh, and so this, this priest was forced to, to resign. A travesty. Of course, then, then there's the recent document, Desiderio Desideravi, in which he takes yet another swipe at tradition. He said... The non-acceptance of the liturgical reform as also a superficial understanding of it distracts us from the obligation of finding responses to the question that I come back to repeating. How can we grow in our capacity to live in full the liturgical action? 
How do we continue to let ourselves be amazed at what happens in the celebration under our very eyes? So I'm, I'm not sure, is he, I mean, is he talking about we're amazed at the clown masses or- No amazement there. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're amazed at the lack of reverence for the Eucharist that people show after decades of, you know, just treating it like popcorn or something, it, you know, I, I don't know what that means. Is, is, he, is he pretending that people that like the old liturgy aren't amazed at the mystery of, of you know, transubstantiation? Given, I, I don't, I don't even understand. the emphasis in the old mass on transubstantiation and the real presence and the utter lack of evidence on those things in the new mass, I don't see any sense of amazement. I mean, how amazing do you feel when you take our Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity into, into your own hands. So, no. Yeah. Of course, just over a year ago, he, he launched his triple salvo against tradition. So in July of 2021, July 16th, Feast of, um, of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, we had the um, ironically named apostolic letter, Tradiciones Custodes, yeah, I mean, it, whoever chose that title, masterful trolling, right? Um, that, you know, but that, which, you know, let, let's give credit where credit is due. You know, somebody, somebody in Rome has got that, that sense of humor. They, they get it. Uh, and, you know, touche. But that wasn't, that wasn't it. It was then followed by a letter explaining the letter. More, more irony. So the, the purpose of a letter is to, is to clarify things at the, at the Pope's own desire, at his, at his request, he writes a letter to clarify things. But it lacked a certain clarity because then another letter was immediately published explaining the letter. In fact, they were published simultaneously. And then doubts were raised, legitimate doubts were raised about the, uh, about the letter. And so in response to the concerns raised regarding the letter, we have another letter the responsa ad dubia, the, the, basically the answer to the, the doubts expressed by, by men whose position it is to express doubts over these things. And the Vatican has pretty much answered all of those doubts through its implementation, which <laughs> has no tolerance whatsoever for anybody who, who prefers tradition. A, lo a lot of these bishops that had had at least tolerated the traditional mass among their clergy and people. Maybe they didn't like it. Maybe they had no opinion about it at all, but it was just kind of, you know, it wasn't causing a problem. So the bishops allowed it. Now the Vatican has really come down hard. It's almost like they're trying to eradicate, eradicate tradition where they can. And yet? And yet one thing that comes up over and over and over again, and that is that when, whenever they're dealing with a, a, the one entity that is unequivocally traditional, that's the Society of St. Pius X. The Holy Father is either silent or he helps them. You know, on, on the contrary, he has been generous in making concessions to the SPX, SSPX that actually serve to strengthen its hand. Jeff, you've delved into this pretty deeply. Can you give us some examples? Yeah, it's, a, it's an extraordinary uh, set of circumstances. And I'm oftentimes asked on social media, you know, what, why does he seem to, to do all these things for the society when he, when he oppresses traditionalists anywhere else? And I, I, I think there's a couple of answers that we'll get into. Let, let's document the, the basis for our entire premise here. The Holy Father has given the society worldwide faculties for confession. They're not limited by diocese. They're not limited by date. It's a, it's a privilege that I'm not aware that exists. I'm not aware of anyone else that has that privilege. Yeah, anywhere uh, in the world. He, he has also <laughs> issued instructions that requires the, the diocesan ordinaries, the bishops of the world, to grant faculties for marriages that are witnessed by SSPX priests. And... And part of what's extraordinary about this is the context. Bishops already had the authority on their own, according to canon law, 
to do that. They, they could have done that on their own. They didn't need the Pope's permission. No, it's, it's more than a permission. It, it, so it's, this has been mandated. Yeah, so this it, letter, this letter where he's instructing them how to do it. Essentially reminding them that um, you have this obligation and, and you need to fulfill it and there's no reason at all not to grant faculties. And it's, and by the way, it is in conformance with canon law. So faculties for a marriage are not like faculties for confession. You can, there, so the society has been given general faculties for all of their priests at all times in all dioceses. Marriages, on the other hand, are very, very different. Canon law, provisions of canon law right now only give faculties on a, on a case-by-case basis unless you're a diocesan pastor. Then you have faculties, general faculties. And so what, what he's saying is simply diocesan bishops, you're required to do what you're required to do, and we're going to insist on it which is to say, give the Society of St. Pius, they, they have, have, diocesan bishops have a choice. They can either grant faculties to the SSPX priest who will wish it, witness the marriage on behalf of the bishop or send his own delegate. But the delegate merely witnesses the ceremony. He does not have to receive the vows. He certainly does not have to say the mass. In point of fact, there need not be a nuptial mass for the marriage to be valid, so. Yeah, so he's the so the Holy Father is going out of his way with confessions and with the sacrament of matrimony, but even more so, he's he's given the bishops of the society the permission to ordain their priests uh, around the world with no geographic limitation, uh, and and even though this was done five years ago, uh, maybe six years ago now. Uh, we still have people, you know, running around the world saying, well, those priests are suspended uh, on divinus. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously you can't be suspended if you have faculty. So that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't work anyway. But such, such subtleties are often lost on the, uh, on the, 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 the social media pundits, the self-styled yeah. canonists, right? And, and then the final example, I think we would point to about just establishing that it's it's objectively true that the, the Holy Father has been so uh, so good to the society that he even recognizes the internal disciplinary decisions taken by the superior general as it regards the discipline of clerics, even to the point of uh, when occasionally it's necessary to laicize a cleric. And that's not always a, a bad thing. Sometimes it happens that a a man is ordained a deacon, for example, he's in major orders. And then at the last second, he, he discerns out, and he says, you know what, I, I'm not supposed to be ordained. And then he eventually petitions to be laicized. And, and, you know, the, the Vatican works with the superior general of the society, just like he would any other, any, any other, any other community. In yeah. fact, this has always been true. The, the society has always, first off, the society accepts the authority of, of the Holy Father. And so when, when, deacons needed to be essentially released from from proceeding further uh, um, transitional deacons needed to be released and not become ordained the society always took those matters to the pope and who dealt with them just as, I mean, they're the most regular irregular folks that you could possibly imagine okay so jeff what's going on well you and i are mere laymen right uh so we can only Speculate, perhaps. Well, let's speculate. <laughs> so per, per, perhaps we can make some educated guesses based on our uh, uh, what we've heard over the decades and our, our insight in, into it and, and what we know about the priests of the society and how they work. Remember that um, the Holy Father was previously the Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires. And we, we know a lot from his time there. And of course, we've had now, what, a decade to study him in, in Rome. He clearly demonstrates an obvious preference for people who are on the fringes. A predilection for the marginalized. The marginalized, whether that's people who are poor and he sees them as kind of not being served by the, the church or, or they're, they're marginalized on the fringe in some other way. And, and he witnessed in Buenos Aires the, the work of the priests of the society in, in poor communities. They weren't showing a Let's face it, they weren't showing the, the normal deference that a lot of clerics have for the rich and the powerful. And look, if you're a pastor of your parish, of course, you're probably going to go to the, you know, the wealthy businessman's house. You're going to have dinner with him. You're going to drink wine. You're going to 
accept his donations and his patronage. That's that's a great thing for a, a pastor to do. But at the same time, you you want those same priests to be working on going to the poor and the orphans and the sick. And 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 so in the mindset of then Cardinal Bergoglio, he saw the society working with these poor communities in Buenos Aires with his own eyes. And perhaps it's worth, it's worth observing as well that um, the man who is now the society's superior general, Don Davide Pairani, was the rector of the seminary down in Argentina. And although it's not clear that they that they met while he was down there, it's certainly clear <clears throat> that, that um, Cardinal Bergoglio was, was aware of their presence, was certainly aware of the existence of the seminary and Don Davide's presence in, in Argentina and the role being played by uh, society priests down there. So I, I, I think that there's a lot of evidence uh, from his time there that he did not see clericalism among the, the society priests that perhaps he thought he saw among diocesan priests or maybe among Opus Dei that we know he's not not fond of of them and and let, let's face another objective truth that society priests tend to be poor right they get no salary they get a, a small stipend just for their basic uh, survival needs they tend to be thin and, and kind of ascetic in nature uh, even and maybe if he didn't live that way, I, I don't know what he did and what he how he lived. But even if he didn't, he obviously appreciated that. And and then of course we have kind of the famous intervention on the society's behalf, where the society came to him and said, you know, we're having problems getting uh, recognized by uh, the government of Argentina as a Catholic order, because you know it's a Catholic country, and so they, they have an official religion down there, and the, and the government was not recognizing the society as a Catholic order, and, and the Cardinal Archbishop stepped in on their behalf. Uh, these are- Just to be clear, this Cardinal Archbishop who stepped in was Cardinal Archbishop Bergoglio, then Cardinal Archbishop, subsequently to become the Pope. Yeah, so I, we're, we can see this, this long history being developed uh, for his preference for the society. I, I don't think it's because he has this great love affair with tradition that we don't know about. I, I think that he just doesn't really care about kind of normal ecclesial rules. He doesn't, he doesn't care about the old tradition. He doesn't, you know, I don't think that he's, you know, I don't think those things matter to him at all. It's just that his operating style, his background is kind of a peronista. He, he just operates more like a don in terms of his governing approach, in terms of it, uh, his, right. yeah, his administration of things. He, he kind of develops favorites, right? And, and so what he saw among the society in Buenos Aires was you've got these simple priests. They don't wear the fanciest uh, clothes. They don't, they don't make a big deal of themselves. They're not on social media. They're not in the, the TV or radio. They're just out there working among the poor. Definitely, definitely no celebrity priests among them. And I, I think in a kind of a weird sort of way that all appealed to him. And then all of a sudden they come to him and they say, you know, your eminence, we need your help. <clears throat> and if and if you're that kind of guy who, who, who sees people as you know clients that come to you and ask a favor and then you're in a position to do them a favor. I think that that appeals to him. And, and so when they came to him with respect and deference and said, hey, we need your help, I think he really liked that. And he, he took pleasure in being able to do that for them and, and solidified their status in, in Argentina as a Catholic order. Uh, and, and of course, we, we've read also that he read the, the uh, biography. I, I was of, just gonna ask, what does he know of Marcel Lefebvre? You know, I don't know other than the fact that we know he read the biography uh, that Bishop Tissier had written about him and that he was a fan of that. And he and he talked about how, you know, Lefebvre was a good man that had been persecuted by by the Roman authorities. And again, you see in that conversation, he sees Lefebvre as a as a man who's been persecuted, who's not liked by the inside. Marginalized. Marginalized. Right. Right, he's not he's not one of the uh, you know the good old boys. He's not part of the establishment, and it's fair to say I think that uh, during his time in Argentina, uh, Bergoglio saw himself that same way. The Jesuits didn't like him because he wasn't 
Jesuit enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't Jesuit enough for them. Uh, he was considered a conservative because he opposed liberation theology. He, he prayed his bravery in Latin. So he probably saw himself as kind of that persecuted on the margin sort of guy. So he made his preference for Lefebvre uh, clear. And, it, and of course, now in Rome, we, we see kind of a continuation of that. Um, although the circumstances have changed, you know, he's not the top guy anymore uh, in just Argentina. He's the top guy in the church. The top he's, guy. He's a little more removed. And I suspect that he's surrounded by people who don't have that same background with the society that he does. They just hate traditional groups. Well, Bishop, Bishop Fillet would tell you that in his dealings with Cardinal Ratzinger, the biggest difficulty that they both had, Bishop Fillet and Cardinal Ratzinger, was, uh, well, uh, Pope Ratzinger, Pope, uh, Pope Benedict, was that the, the Pope could not assert his will because of uh, members of the, of the Curia who despised tradition. And so he couldn't govern. Yeah, let's, let's face it, you know, when you're the Pope, you might theoretically be the most powerful man in the world, but you're dependent upon those people that you've surrounded yourself you're with. You're dependent on loyal lieutenants and he didn't have them. Yeah. And, and as, as, much as, um, as much as it seems there's greater affinity between Pope Bergoglio and certain members of his security, by no means do they march in lockstep. Yeah, and so I don't think there's any doubt that now that he's in Rome, he's a little more out of touch, right? He's not riding the subway every day. He can't just slip out and see what's going on and sneak into, you know, parishes and, and observe. So he's much more dependent upon the, the people that are around him and their opinions. And it's clear that those people don't like tradition. They don't like the traditional Latin mass. They don't like traditionalists. They... They see the Institute Christ the King. They see the Fraternity of St. Peter. They see all these diocesan traditional priests. And when you have high profile bishops and cardinals that travel the world and, 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 and do what they're doing, those things kind of agitate the question. And, and so I think they have, they've made those folks, those other traditionalists, non-SSPX people, they've kind of made those the, the scapegoat if you will, the, the target of attention for those prelates that are around Francis. But those folks are not being exposed to the society, right? All right. Um, it, it, it really is an interesting phenomenon. Interesting. I, I, don't, I don't know that it's been treated well elsewhere. Um, but well, you, you've been around the society for, for decades, and you know that, that they kind of keep their heads down. They're out of the news. They're not on social media. They don't do interviews. They just quietly go about their work. In fact, the one man who saw fit to be in the news and to make a bit of a public scene was castigated sharply by the Superior General and wouldn't desist and then was asked to leave. Uh, it's not their style. They're very much focused on administering the sacraments, the traditional sacraments to the faithful and the salvation of souls. How crazy is that? Yeah. So I, I think we've got this strange situation where among the, the leading prelates and among the people in Rome, the society is almost invisible. I mean, there, there, you know, there are a few uh, media organizations or bloggers that are obsessed with them, but, but among the rest of the global church, they're just kind of, you know, from uh, under, under the radar. Yeah. And, and whereas the other traditionalists are favored by cardinals and bishops, and so they're kind of always in the news and, and rubbing him the wrong way. I, I'm not saying that all the things he've done, he's done for the society are because he shares their mission. Oh, on the contrary. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it, it's just this weird kind of affinity for persecuted groups that, that he has. And, and uh, of course, let's face it too, uh, I think he likes to kind of play people off on each other. He he likes to kind of set up people to to do combat and 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 see kind of how they fight and how they handle adversity and who comes out on top. 
and, and, and watch them have at it. You know, Jeff, um, I wonder if there's something else that contributes to this, this apparent favoritism toward the SSPX. I mean, there's a general principle in, in governance that says that you, you don't make a rule that you can't enforce. Traditional groups such as the ICK and the FSSP um, cherish the fact that, that they are formally approved and have formally regular canonical standing. Yeah, of course, that, that was the whole basis for the founding of the Fraternity of St. Peter was that they would be the, the good guys, right? The, uh, the approved version of the SSPX. As With essentially the same mission, the same, <laughs> the same construct, and strangely, the, the same first four letters in their name. So it's the FSSP, whereas the formal uh, name for the Society of St. Pius Stent is the FSSPX. So interesting. And they chose St. Peter. Um, and by the way, um, I do believe there were men of conscience who were very uneasy about the, the looming excommunication, putative excommunication of Archbishop Lefebvre. I do not believe they were all men of ill will. Absolutely not. But that, uh, that being able to march forward with quote unquote approved status was, was lucrative for them. That was important to them. Well, of course. I mean, I, I think any Catholic would take seriously the threat of, of canonical discipline, let alone excommunication. I mean, anybody who really loves the church and, and who sees the, uh, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, as their father, uh, in your case, father, in my case, grandfather, anybody would, would take that seriously, right? And, and so this is not a criticism of the, of the fraternity, but clearly they had this great advantage and have exploited it for decades, as I would if I were in their position to say, hey, we're the, absolutely, absolutely. We're, we're, we're the approved ones, we're the ones that are canonically regular, and, and um, hey, can't blame them for that. No, no. They have a lot to lose because they, they cherish this, this approbation. Um, and, and, and of course, the, the contrary is because the society has never had all of, all of that uh, kind of approbation and, uh, and the establishment's approval and so forth, they don't have anything to lose relatively. Right, right. right. So if, if Francis were to, to zero in on the SSPX and issue unjust edicts against the SSPX in particular, <laughs> the SSPX would do what they do, which is basically thumb their noses at him and continue to just disregard the decrees, which they have every moral and canonical right and duty to do. Yeah, so I, I don't see the, the contradiction to, on the one hand, rejoice when the Holy Father grants you what you ask for, just like any, any child would his own father, right? It would be grateful for that. And then simultaneously, if, if given an, an unjust or immoral order, would, would ignore that. Uh, I, I think that's hard for a lot of people who maybe are new to Catholicism or new to a, you know, a, a more complete understanding of, of Catholicism, right? We're not just mindless robots, but, but we're supposed to have a well-formed conscience and understand how, what are the, the obligations of virtue are in any given situation. Understanding that, we can look at how Francis has, has frankly kind of squandered a, a great deal of political capital in this pursuit of tradition. He's, he's more and more being seen by a larger audience as, a, as an ineffectual leader, right? I mean, I, even those who, who previously favored him <laughs> routinely speak of the day when he will go to meet his maker or resign. <clears throat> and there's, there's apparently a groundswell among them on both sides of the aisle, uh, to use a, a, a rather United States metaphor, to, to resign because he is seen as ineffectual. Yeah, so we have this situation where just just a few years ago, anybody who was fond of the SSPX, who went to their chapels or supported them, was they were still the bad guys, and they were still looked down upon by people who thought they were better traditionalists. And, and now he's gone after them, and suddenly they realize, well, maybe just being the fair hair boy isn't all it's cracked up to be. 
if even they are now seeing that if if the Pope would go after the SSPX at this point, which would make no sense after all of the things he's done for him, but he would achieve nothing. It would he would seem even more impotent. And and, and speaking realistically, these other organizations soon enough will be faced with a choice because if they're true to their charism, which is the traditional Latin mass, if they're denied canonically, but illegally denied that opportunity, they're gonna find themselves in a difficult spot because ultimately they're either gonna have to abdicate and, 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 and go to the Society of St. Pius X or become the Society of St. Pius X. And I mean, what is the FSSP? If the FSSP decides to, or the ICK or any one of the many other groups decide to thumb their noses at the Pope, then they just become utterly indistinct from the, from the, the SSPX. And oh, by the way, there's a reason why Procter & Gamble makes two brands of detergent and puts them on the same shelf for each other because they get more share that way. I'm happy to have more market share in terms of Catholic people in the pews at the traditional Latin mass. And, and let's be clear what you mean about that. Not everybody has the business background. By market share, what you mean is a, a greater sum of the total that exists, right? It's not this kind of partisanship of, we just wanna win. You're saying, no, we're happy to have all these groups if it just means more right. people in tradition. Right, so, so General Motors makes two varieties of automobiles. They're essentially the same, the badging is different. But by having two automobiles on the market, the combined share between the two of them is more than the share, the number of buyers that they would have if they only had one brand on the market. And and of course, back to your points about the fraternity or the institute. Uh, so they've been doing wonderful things and as much as they're bringing people to tradition and encouraging an authentic understanding of, of Catholicism, <laughs> But, they've, but they're in a precarious position if, if their whole claim to existence is their approval. Is approbation, right. Yeah. Then, very precarious. Then they're very precarious. And, and I would have to disagree with you on one, one point of distinction. If they now find themselves persecuted and they disobey, they're not in the position of the society today. They're in the position of the society 30 years ago. In 1987, in fact. Right, because the society today has this extraordinary license. Okay, point taken. Of, point taken. Of, right, kind of a, it's, it's an irregular regularization that they've received <laughs> from the highest authority in the church. If, if, if these guys that are traditional priests in the diocese or the fraternity or the institute get suspended, get suspended, they go back to where Marcel Lefebvre was in yeah the late seventies. Yeah, and that we, we don't we don't take. I any, don't wish that on them. Right, we don't take any joy in that. That's just a that's just a recognition of a recognition of the reality, and and so God works in mysterious ways. And of course. He has a hand in all of this. Just Jeff, Jeff, what do you make of the off-turret speculation that Francis is purposefully trying to corral traditionalists into the SSPX so that he can gather them all in one place and then and then deal one final fatal blow and eradicate tradition from the planet? Yeah, I don't I don't uh, buy that that argument. I mean, for whatever reasons, the society seems to have been. Uh, preserved from the persecutions of the past, whether by uh, previous pontiffs or, or uh, cardinals and bishops, um, notwithstanding the, the constant refrain that they have an irregular canonical status, which I've, I've made nothing, clear. Honestly. Yeah, I mean, th there is no such thing, right? You're, you're either Catholic or not. Um, the, the canonical status of many orders over the years has, has, has fluctuated, although today it's clear that they have the, the Holy Father's endorsement. Um, they're, they're treated as though they're, they're regular. Maybe even you could say it's bizarre, but you could almost even say they're privileged, papally privileged. I, and I guess that could change in an instant, right? It seems unlikely to change under this pontificate. I don't think there are many cardinals likely to persuade him that he's wrong, uh, but perhaps under a future pontiff that could change. And in any case, one of the things we know about the society is the stability over the last 40 years. They're just gonna keep doing what Please they're- God, they'll just keep doing what they're doing. Yeah. So we, we have this, this weird situation, unfortunately, where the 
the priests of the society benefit from these circumstances. But when we step back as just Catholics without any sort of, you know, uh, conditioning of that statement, it, the persecutions are not good for the faithful. They're not good for tradition. I absolutely agree. Um, we see the law of unintended consequences hard at work here. The society has seen explosive growth as an undesirable from the from the perspective of the anti-traditionalists in the Curia, the undesirable consequence of traditionis custodis and um, uh, yeah. to, to the benefit of the society. And of course, while the implementation of traditionis custodis is not going as well as perhaps the Pope would like, it's still having an, an adverse effect on the, the total number of people who would be exposed to and, and would like to attend the traditional Latin Mass. I, I would certainly agree. And, and not only, I mean, the traditional Latin Mass, it, it, it's well that, that the society maintains these, these priories, uh, these, its chapels, but Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre was very clear that this is a holding action. This is not how things should be. The traditional Latin Mass belongs in Catholic churches, diocesan parish churches, and it should be being said by parish priests. That's where it belongs. And again, it is being forced to the margins. So Jeff, where do we go from here? What should we expect from Pope Francis? Well, I, I regret to, to say it. I mean, none of us want to be critical of, of our fathers, <laughs> spiritual or otherwise, but uh, it seems likely based on the people who are in charge, the people who surround the Pope, they, who feed him information and who then uh, are delegated to carry out his will, there's likely to be a continued persecution of, of tradition and the traditional groups. Uh, and I think there's likely under this pontificate to, to be kind of this continued largesse during... I wonder, I wonder what would be the next really cool thing that Pope Francis could do for the society. I mean, he could grant them absolute unequivocal unambiguous canonical status and 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 make that absolutely uh, a, a thing of the past you know i i think that's possible but the the pattern seems to be that the society goes to him and and asks something of him and then he gives it uh and it seems to me and i i hate to go here but this is i think the truth it seems to me that the the next major thing that would happen is if the society went to him and said, hey, we need to consecrate some new bishops. Here's our list. Good point. Right? They would hand him a list of, of a couple of names. My guess is if that were to happen, he would just, you know, pick one and hand it back to him and it would be no big deal to him. <laughs> Blessed be God. We can only hope. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I'm not making a prediction. Let's let's. Uh... No, 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 no. Let's just stop that in its tracks. Jeff, Jeff, Jeff Casman is not prognosticating. He just like made an offhand remark. Everybody yeah. can relax. You know, the thing is, this is going to continue to create problems for the society. Um, chapels around the world are struggling to deal with the growth and increasingly larger crowds. I saw a great meme. Some guy say he's writing a letter to the Holy Father, expressing his anger because now it takes him a half an hour to find a. Parking space at his SSPX chapel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and it you know it, it's the same everywhere uh, that I've heard of. Everywhere I travel, certainly the case here in Nashville, where the the Bishop of Nashville has been very generous with the society, granted faculties and so forth. But the diocesan traditional parishes are standing room only. The SSPX mission chapel standing room only. Parking is a problem. Uh, so this is Jeff, if the if the traditional Latin mass were put on an even footing with the Novus Ordo Mise, the Novus Ordo Mise would be gone from the planet as soon as the last boomer dropped dead. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, final thoughts. Um, I think there's another problem, and that is that a great many people are coming to um, principally the SSPX from diocesan and other Latin masses um, where these masses are being canceled. Chicago, Chicago is, it's just getting silly. I mean, they were, they were bursting at the seams before uh, the, the Cardinal there put an end to uh, the ICK's endeavors. Um, a lot of these folks are not well-versed in tradition and they need help in getting on board. A woman at our uh, St. Anthony's here in Mount Holly, North Carolina, was talking to me just uh, 
just Sunday about how newcomers don't understand that we don't talk in church before mass. We pray and we get recollected and we don't talk during mass and that we're not constantly getting up and down. Um, there's a, there's a, a lack of, of reverence amongst, and God bless them, but this is all, this is what newcomers, that's all they know. Um, they, they don't know when we have half the people standing and half the people kneeling at a sung mass when the Santu starts. And my, my answer was Jeff Kasman and I answered these questions. <laughs> so, yeah, well, that, that's why we're here, right? Folks that are listening, uh, that's why we're doing this. That's why we're giving our, our time. Jim is, is a very busy retiree. I've got a, a day job and try to take care of my family. We are giving back based on our experiences. This is a volunteer effort. We just want to share and, and educate so that those of you that are new or maybe you've been coming a long time. What do you mean, you, you're not monetizing this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, there's, you'll notice there's no Patreon. There's no donate <laughs> we're, here. We're not, we're not looking for clickbait. Yeah, we're just, we're, we're doing our best. We do a lot of research before these, uh, these conversations to make sure that we're passing along what our grandparents and your grandparents would have known and believed and understood. But because of what Jim just said, because you go to a, a, a chapel somewhere and you see different people doing different things and you go online and you see people saying different things, you know, uh, simple yes, no questions and you get both answers, right? That's why we're trying to give back. And, and we hope that you appreciate it. We hope that you'll share with us when you're confused by an answer, when you think we've not done a good job. Well, I, I know you'll tell us when you think we've not done a good job. But when we fail to address the questions that you have, those, those burning issues that, that are not being answered elsewhere, let us know. We want to help you. Jim, final thoughts? Um, I'm pretty happy, Jeff. Thank you very much. Right. I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to be with us. Likewise. Folks, thank you for uh, listening in. If you like what we're doing here, please share this with your friends, like and subscribe on YouTube, post it on your other social media channels. There are lots of people out there who are uh, having questions about the Catholic faith and tradition, and we want to be of help in our uh, own humble way. Jim, thank you again for being with us. Thank you, Jeff. God bless you. My friends, God bless you. We'll see you the next time.